thanks everyone for coming to this um, lecture and discussion with Angelica Hinterplander. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> In the context of artistic practice. Um, so the course for those of you who are, um, I think we're joined also by some, some visitors. Um, it's called Why Have There Been No Great Women Architects? And this is like our kind of focus this semester. Um, and I'll just briefly introduce Angelica. So Angelica Hinterbrander works as a freelance editor, project manager and digital strategist in various collaborations on projects, contents and formats within the field of architecture and beyond. She studied architecture here at the Graz University of Technology and at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And currently she collaborates with Brandon Hoover Plus, um, reflecting on, question, on the question, who architects in the context of the commodification of space and new models of architectural production. Together with Contextur, she is exploring the potentials and responsibilities of future architects. And since this year, 2021, she is teaching assistant at Etihad Zurich as a member of Studio Anna Brandelhuber. In parallel, she is also enrolled, enrolled in the postgraduate program Leadership uh, Digital Innovation at the University of the Arts in Berlin. Um, so thank you for joining us and we'll give the uh, floor to you now. And then afterwards we'll open up, we'll have a discussion and we'll try to mediate a discussion here um, in Halle and also with um, everyone joining us on Zoom. Um, there is a comment that we can't hear. Oh. <laughs> so maybe, um, can you check? What microphones? Yes, so I'm going to check. Now we are using this microphone. Okay. Maybe you try to speak. I speak. Can and you hear us? Need to... I can. Ah, okay, thank you. Says you can hear okay. Us. okay. So Good. maybe it's Good. like this one yeah. is too far. Did you also hear us before? But you don't need to reintroduce me because I got a microphone is fine. Okay. Microphone is fine. Thanks so much. <laughs> Maybe somebody just has the uh, speaker. Excuse <laughs> also like. Okay, good. So, yeah, thanks for the very nice introduction. Um, I was, I'm very honored to be here in this kind of like. Uh, set up and you know, like talking in the framework of the topic you picked for this uh, for the semester. Um, I will before I start presenting, I will just quickly give you an idea of what I'm gonna do or like how I responded to the invite, let's say, because I yeah I thought about like my own position in the field and I brought this question with me that is like part of my everyday work, let's say, am I actually an architect? Because I'm working in the, like, let's say, gray scale of architecture in a way. And this defines very much how I work and what I do. And like, I would maybe say even how I find my way or how I try to find my way in the field. Um, so you already heard this kind of introduction, what I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of things and all of these things are, or have the thing together that they are not really object bound. So most of the work is somehow theoretic or it's got to do with communication in a form. Um, and that got to do with my interests that formed over the past 10 years. So what we're gonna do now together is like go through my 10 years of being in the architectural field and see how I ended up where I'm now. Um, and I picked this way of having the presentation because I think the, the self narration of how we understand ourselves as architects or like how we tell our own stories have a big impact on ourselves, of course, on our way, how we do things, how we work in the field. But at the same time, it's got an influence on the next generation that is coming because, for example, when I was studying or like still, I mean, it's not so long ago, um, I hardly had any role models that were doing what I'm doing now. And there are still like very few people that are doing that. So I'm kind of like 
trying to uh, yeah, just take you with me through the last 10 years. So in general, the topics I'm, I'm interested in, um, because I always have the feeling when I'm in Graz, everyone knows because I studied here and I still meet so many people that I know, everyone knows what I'm doing kind of ish. Uh, so I try to explain what I do uh, more detailed. So if there's any, any part missing or you, you kind of like don't understand where I'm going, just let me know. Um, you can as well just raise your hand or send a comment and I will answer in between so I don't have a problem with interruptions. So the topics I'm interested in or working on at the moment are pretty much between um, economy, digitalization, politics of space. That is somehow the baseline, I would say. Um, I'm very much interested in systemic transformation. So this kind of like meta level that um, is as well quite a big um, scale, let's say. And then um, the topic of women in architecture came somehow through um, Instagram as well. Um, I find this idea of narration, especially, or like I picked as well this way of re narrating what I'm doing because a lot of my work is taking part in, in the digital sphere. And as you know, Instagram is kind of like a tool of narration. So this is kind of like connected as well with the method I'm using here now for the presentation. So here's just a quick yeah, graphic of the three most yeah, pressing uh, topics that are somehow coming together uh, in my work. And depending on what project I'm working on, it's yeah, sometimes uh, climate crisis, resource and resilience is more important uh, than technology. But in general, I'm moving in between these three fields, I would say. And then um, the layer of narration is kind of like on top of this. This is a screenshot of um, a film that was done by Anu Brandelhuber, Christopher Roth, and um, Olaf Graviat, the a team I'm working with at the moment as well, um, Brandelhuber Plus. And the, the step of, or like being at this office at the moment, um, kind of like um, put more importance on, on the topic of narration. Um, so we are, I'm, I'm currently um, figuring out, let's say, how to, to use narration even more in my work. But I will start with Instagram. So this is my account as it is now. Uh, this uh, a screenshot from today. Um, but to understand the full story, we, we jump from the here and now into 10 years ago. We jump to where I'm from. Um, so I come from a very small Bavarian village, 1,000 um, citizens living there. Um, and this background is very important because if you wouldn't know, where I'm, or like, yeah, a lot of people in architecture come from backgrounds with architecture in a way. I don't have this background. So my parents didn't work in architecture. I don't have any network through my parents. I grew up in a very, yeah, down to earth surrounding, very, yeah, as just like you imagine a Bavarian village. Um, a lot of traditions, a lot of things happening. And I think it was more coincidental that I ended up um, going to the gymnasium and um, getting my degree there. One aspect um, that I find very important, considering this is as well the um, equality in education. So I'm one of the very few people I have no academic background in my family. So my parents didn't study. I was the first person in the family to study and to enter the academic field. So it's uh, in a way a, a very rare situation to like that I'm in. Um, and the to reflect this was an important point, I think as well for myself to understand why I ended up where I'm now. Um, there is this, yeah, that's a German text, um, I'll just read it quickly. 
Wer meint, der Zugang zu Abitur und Uni ließe sich vor allem mit, wie, mit individuellem Ehrgeiz und Fleiß erklären, der behauptet etwas Ungehörliches, dass nämlich Menschen aus nicht akademikerhaushalten entweder von Natur aus weniger ehrgeizig und fleißig sind oder eben Opfer einer falschen Erziehung. So this idea of that I need to put a lot of effort and work into where I am or when I, where I want to go, kind of like is a super important narrative threat, I would say, in my life. So I, I knew that I needed to work for where I want to get, but, or like this, let's say, neoliberal idea of individual um, uh, work and effort you need to put to be successful was very, very present in how I grew up. And yeah, when I started to study, this was, uh, I think, how I understood myself. If I would work hard enough, I would get somewhere. So in 2011, I started studying at the TU Graz, um, which was pretty um, incidental, I would say. I, because I'm from Germany, so I applied in Germany and Austria because it's very close to the border, as you saw before at the map. Um, And I, at that time I had a boyfriend in Austria. So I was like, oh my God, maybe I should study in Austria because then it's easier to see him still. Uh, of course, the relationship ended pretty quickly after I moved to Graz. Um, but I was really lucky that I moved here because in the first year, I don't know if it's still like that, but in the first year, everyone had the freedom to kind of like catch up on things. So you were pretty, uh, because there are, the, there are people from the HTL, from the AHS, from different backgrounds. So here at the at Theo Graz, you have time to kind of like get on the same level. I think if I would have, had, would have started at another university, I would not have even made it through the first year. So I had time to explore and I was lucky enough to um, do my first year with Uli Tischner. That will come up in this presentation later on again. So I jump to the first image that you might know as well from the poster. Um, this was the first biennial we went to with Gestalten und Entwerfen. Uh, that's how the course was called when I started studying here. And it was literally the first time I went to this kind of a cultural exhibition or like yeah, architectural and, and, and cultural exhibition. And it was really, yeah, it was not mind blowing, but it was, um, Yeah, it extended my idea of how I understand the world and as well, like to see so many different national contributions was pretty important, I think. So with moving to Graz, my, yeah, my scale or my, my, my field of um, living, moving, traveling expanded a bit. So here you can see uh, still Bavaria and can you see my mouth? No. Um, so Graz, whether at Dot is and, and Vienna, so I started traveling more. And here I actually started as well in 2000, 2011 with Instagram. And yeah, you can see there was an Arc Plus issue already. Um, I worked for Arc Plus later. So it's actually quite nice to have this, let's say, timeline. Um, where I can still see what I did at the time. And this is as well how I will go through the different phases now. Um, after studying, I pretty quickly um, became a teaching assistant because I needed to earn money because my parents said, we pay your rent, but the rest you need to earn yourself. So I yeah, uh, tried to get a job and was lucky enough to um, Yeah, get a job at uh, Gebäudelehre Institute. And I worked there for like one semester. I remember my um, introductory um, meeting with them. They were like, we need at least someone that stays a year. And after half a year, I said, okay, I got this internship at MBRDW. I will leave to the Netherlands now. So um, we kind of like stroll up. And here you can see some pictures uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, so I started working um, at MVRDV. What was really important for me as well, going there. So the, the map expands again. I moved to Rotterdam and worked there for around half a year. 
And going there, working with so many international people was very important because that was the first time I realized because there were a lot of people from yeah, good schools, Ivy League schools, ETH Zurich. So I got introduced to how the system works because here Graz is pretty chill and small and you can do whatever you want. And at MVRDV, it was like crazy hours, a lot of work, competition, like pam, pam, pam. It was really, it was super hard. Um, it was not good for my health. Um, but at that time, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, I don't know energy idea of working a lot achieving a lot so this was an important phase as well to understand the logics of big offices and to yeah have an insight into the system how these big names um, work after that i came back to the parts this is 2014 and 15 um, and when i came back i only had i think one more year to finish my bachelor's and as i was trained in working a lot and be quick with stuff. I, it was pretty easy to finish the stuff, do some work besides. And then I started applying for, I forgot the thing. I got this internship at MVRDV through a scholarship um, of Baumeister Magazine. So it was very, I ran, I'm just good with finding scholarships, I think. So I randomly applied there and not randomly, but I sent my application and was lucky enough to get it. Um, so I kind of like this made it possible for me to even go there because of course, big offices to pay shit and I could not have gone if I would not have gotten the scholarship. Um, I did not even tell my parents that I would go because I was like, no, but I don't tell them. I just try to make the money work and then I go. So when I knew I got the scholarship and I can make it, I told them that I would move to the Netherlands and then I just did it. Um, uh, after being back, um, I applied for another thing, um, EASA. I don't know if you heard of that. That's the, I say it wrong for sure, uh, European Association of Architecture uh, Students Assembly, something like that um yes exactly um it's a quite big network and i went there for three times um and in different years so sometimes as a participant and one time as a tutor and this network of people were or like the network of of architects is and was super important as well so another thread that is super important as well now in my work is networks, building up connections with a lot of different people. So here you can see basically the turn or the transition from EASA, like I did a photography workshop with the pictures. And then after having this break during the summer, I moved for my masters or like the first year of my masters to Hong Kong doing another exchange or like yeah having the um oh, how is it called another scholarship from the TU Graz not Erasmus but the other one where you can go to an international university I actually wanted to do my master's at the ETH in Zurich but well, that did not work out on one hand because I didn't get accepted and it would not have worked out even if I would have been accepted due to money reasons. So like money was always a, like somehow I needed to make sure that I have enough money to get through the things because I myself decided that I didn't want to ask my parents for money. They still gave me the, the rent, let's say, but I always wanted to make sure myself that I can sustain myself, let's say. So I expanded the map again <laughs> for quite a, quite a bit. Hong Kong was, a real fantastic experience. Um, I enjoyed it very much. Um, here you can see me presenting my second studio. It was fantastic, exhausting, exciting. I met a lot of people and I worked so much as I did not before and I didn't after. So this, the, um, the culture of being in the studio all day, every day, like some people even slept there, um, was super intense. 
And I decided to participate in that to a certain degree because I really wanted to get to know the students there and the culture and how architecture functions there. So I decided to really dive into how they do things. And at the same time, because Hong Kong was more expensive than being in Austria and Graz, I worked for the civil engineers here um, and made a book for them. So I kind of like had a side job in Austria while being there to have enough money to as well do fun stuff. Um, and I stayed there for a full year. Uh, I did two studios and I made some really good friends. Um, it was the in-between time of the Umbrella Revolution protests and the protests that were happening in 2019. So it was at that time, it was pretty um, safe and, and okay to, to be there. The repression of Hong Kong was not um, as intense uh, through China, um, but the, the political level or like the political layer was very important for me to, I don't know, um, I think I, I got politicized pretty much there. Um, and I, when I arrived there, I made friends from um, the Hong Kong Central University, all of them women, and all of them very politically active. Um, two of them were from the UK and working in the nonprofit sector. Uh, we are still in contact and in, in close exchange. And they started a, um, a, oh, yeah, a kind of like a refugee program through the university there. And they kind of like made me participate. So it was um, it was a super intense phase of my life on, on several levels, on one hand on the architectural level, and on one hand as well on the political level, let's say. Um, and I think that was the, yeah, not the first time maybe, but um, for sure I had moments when I, the campus was one on kind of a mountain, the architecture school was at the very base, and when I, because I lived on the campus, because they have housing on the campus, and sometimes I went to bed really late at like three or four in the morning. So I kind of like walked up the hill um, because I enjoyed the freedom and, and peace of the night because I lived with someone else. So I kind of like adjusted my sleep rhythm so that I would wake up alone and go to sleep without anyone disturbing me. Very weird, but that kind of like was the, the modus that worked best for me. But I, at that time, I, I think the first time reflected heavily on if I would like to work in that way for longer or not. Then I came back uh, for doing my last year in Graz and I did the studio with uh, at the IZK. What was a really cool um, yeah, last, last studio to do because it was architecture but not architecture in a way um, so I think that that formed my um, or like started to form my interest in that direction for sure as well and I went to um, the conference the future architecture conference in Ljubljana that sadly was um, closed down very recently uh, through or due to a right-wing um, uh, government in Slovenia and there I met as well a lot of people um, hell no that was I think even the presentation of Charlotte Malterbart and um, Dubi that worked here as well um, so another layer of connections and networks came through that or like I got aware of the the chance to apply there as a young architect and to present a project um, so this was an important moment and I referred to Uli before already. Um, I when always when I was in Graz, I worked for Gebäudelehre again. So I kind of like came back and could start to work immediately again. And Uli, I started working for Uli and I always stick with Uli. 
So you can't tell that I did show this image because she doesn't like it. <laughs> I, I took the picture uh, when I was a student assistant during one of the crits. And uh, she is until now, I think, uh, one of the most important role models I have in architecture. And um, after, or like being aware of that I would need to end my studies very soon, I decided to apply for internships again, because I was aware that if I wouldn't do an internship now, it would be impossible do, to do certain things afterwards. So I thought, let's apply at ARC Plus, because it would be very smart, because there is no chance to get in there after graduation. Um, I could maybe apply for this scholarship, do this mama ma, so I applied. I had an interview with them. It was a really great interview and they did never reply again, <laughs> kind of. -ish. Um, so I applied at the same time in Switzerland uh, because I thought, okay, if I can't do this theory-based um, work, then I maybe do something in a real office. And Buchner Bründler was a really nice reference in one of the studios I did. So I thought maybe Switzerland is good because they pay. Um, and it's a nice office, so I apply there, and um, it worked out. So in 2017, I moved, moved to Basel. I was packing things here in the Zeifensaal. When I had an incoming call, I answered the phone, and Ann Lin, the editor-in-chief of ARC Plus, was calling me after six months after the interview we had, and he was like, Hello, Angelica. Could you maybe start in two weeks at Arc Plus? And I was like, um, I'm moving to Switzerland now. I can't. Um, so this was a very weird call. I had to sit down immediately after that because I was so confused um, and very sad and, I don't know, excited at the same time because they asked me to come. But I already confirmed that I would go to Switzerland. Um, so I wrote them a very nice email that I very much appreciate, that they think I could work for them, and that if there would be a chance, maybe later, that I would like to work for them. So I kind of try to, to balance the situation. Then I moved to Basel to work there, and at the same time, another thread starts. Um, this is a project I did in, in Hong Kong, and I, yeah, as you saw before, I Instagrammed already and I followed quite some pages and under those pages was uh, as well context tour. Um, and I sent my material to Katarina. At that time, I didn't even, they were not using names, so I didn't know where I sent it to. I just sent an email and then they published it. And I thought, ah, that's really nice to have this published. And then we started kind of like Insta, Insta direct messaging, but nothing happened. So this kind of like was a silent thread starting. So this is at Buchner Bründler. Um, it was really nice. I had a fun time, but I did not work out like hierarchically. It did not work for me in this office. The office is amazing. If you want to work there, I can only recommend applying because they're doing amazing stuff. But I was working for Dani, one of the, the heads of the office, and we just did not match. So I was like, after four or five months, I was like, maybe I'm not going to stay for a year. Maybe I just apply at Arc Plus again to go there again. So I wrote a nice email. Um, yeah, here you can see how I, I'm usually looking for apartments. The red uh, image was when I was searching an apartment in Basel. Um, so yeah, I restarted the application process with Arc Plus and in 2018, I moved to Berlin because they were still working on the issue they planned or like they interviewed me for. Um, the issue, I think it was the issue with the most delay ever. Uh, the issue was running for more than two and a half years, including the research phase. Um, so I was still in time. I moved there. I searched for another apartment through Instagram. I found one. Um, and then I worked on quite some issues for Arc Plus. I started with 231, the property issue. 
what was actually an issue uh, um, or like a collaborative issue with Brandluber Plus. So that was the first time when I met Olaf and Arno, Olaf Gravert and Arno Brandluber as well in the office. And yeah, this was the time as well when I started to dig into contents more intensively. So I came there with hardly any editorial experience, of course, just like any other intern. Um, but I always enjoyed reading and I always, I thought I liked writing in a way. Um, so I just jumped into what I had to do and kind of like had the chance to get a lot of responsibility due to some shifts in the team. And I stayed there for quite a while. Um, what was only possible because I still had money from working in Switzerland because Arc Plus is of course paying shit. I stayed there for around one and a half, almost two years until the issue post humane architecture. So you can see it in the, in the upper row. That was the last issue I did. And this was another collaborative issue with Brandlube Plus. So the, the one with the um, black hole you see was the, the Datatopia issue, the main issue I was working on um, actually. And the post architecture was then the second one I did as editorial manager. So I quickly moved within the team uh, from being an intern to having responsibility for kind of like an issue due to some people leaving. Uh, what was quite um, intense and amazing at the same time. Um, but the like the jumping within the organizational unit was pretty difficult because when you arrive as an intern and then you get more responsibility, there is still, sometimes it's hard to be heard. And this was a bit difficult for me. So I decided as well due to the fact that the payment was so bad that, that I had to stop working for them. And um, I actually transitioned pretty smoothly to Brandlube Plus because at that time they got the biennial and they looked for someone in the office that would do um, or would take over the position that Olaf had, Olaf Gravert had. So he was kind of like, um, the connecting point between the ETH, the theoretic work and the, the architectural work. So this suited my idea of what I wanted to do pretty perfectly. So I said, send me a list of what you want me to do and I will decide if I want to come. And then I moved to Grand Hood Plus. Uh, this is actually the first project I did in the office. Um, I was responsible for the redevelopment of the website what was quite a extensive and intensive project because we redid the entire, yeah. Um, so you can see the, the sorting at the right side with all the numbers. So the projects are sorted through the project numbers. So we made a whole list and a huge Excel file uh, listing and kind of like sorting what different kind of projects were developed in the office. So it was on one side, developing a strategy and um, idea of how the page needed to look like. And on the other side, it was a huge learning process because we could dive into the projects and really understand what the, what the practice is like. And it was actually quite a great chance to, to start in the office because it really made me understand what the logics of the office are, what is quite specific, because it's not only, if you know Brandenburg Plus, it's not only the architectural projects like Anti Villa or Brunnenstraße, or you, you might know the projects, but it's as well initiatives and campaigns, a lot of communication, narration, and especially the connection between um, political issues, um, active participation in, in communication and the connection through the build, like building the argument um, is super important and was and still is um, very attractive to me. 
So we basically landed in the here and now. Um, I'm still working with and for Handelhuber Plus, E Plus. We're currently renaming um, ourselves. And yeah, the office is currently in the process of redeveloping the practice itself. Um, so now I'm part of this redevelopment process, what is pretty much strategy and yeah, thinking about how to or like in what framework we're doing architecture. Um, and at the same time, now we're jumping kind of like back into my Instagram account. Um, 2038 happened, um, the German contribution to the architectural biennial that was running or like is running till next week, this week weekend. Um, so through the network of Brandlhuber Plus, another, let's say, world or like another chance of being part of the architectural industry opened up um, because the network is, of course, really, really great. Um, Arno worked with a lot of people. The, the practice is based on collaboration. So being able to work in the office opened up a lot of doors, of course. Um, when I had my interview with Brandlhuber Plus, what was a lunch uh, at a restaurant, it was very nice. Um, Arno said, we need someone that needs to be able to pragmatically solve stuff and do things and hold lectures and just go for things, basically. Um, so the idea was when I came that I could really take over tasks and basically freely um, pick what I wanted to do and develop ideas and projects as well. This was one of the reasons why I decided to start working with them. Um, and yeah, so kind of like last year, I started to do a lot of lectures for Brandlhuber as well. And yeah, now here is the reframing of the um, of the yeah of the office named already so we're currently digging into the parameters of of work like asking for what clients are we actually working where does the money come from what are the parameters we are defining with how we do projects and with whom we do projects like what does it need for us to work as architects on something. And above you can see um, San Gimiano, the new office we, we moved into. There is it's still a building site, now it's a proper office. And one connecting point um, is this amazing graphic. Um, when I was, I jumped back a bit in time, when I was at Arc Plus, there was a moment I was really frustrated because I was doing something I really enjoyed doing. It was fantastic to have time to work on content intensively for such a long time, but I couldn't self-sustain because I did not have enough money. So I decided that I need to find a way to be more flexible in the industry or to kind of like jump out of the industry if I wanted to. So I decided to apply for another master's degree at the UDK in Berlin, the Leadership in Digital Innovation Program, what was really fitting well because I did this digital issue with Arc Plus. So I had a lot of knowledge already in that direction and the studies are focusing a bit more on, let's say the business side and integrating design from a non-architectural perspective. So, with diving into these studies, I started as well diving more into economics and complexity overall, like how does our economy work like, how do we move in it, what does competition mean like, and this as well, of course, came back in 2038. So a lot of top topics were somehow are interconnected. And as well now, um, the projects that I'm working on, there are super many cross references. So like with context tool, you dive into working conditions that we are having as a topic in the office as well. And then I do something on my personal Instagram. So everything is somehow connected and I'm moving in this field of the three topics that I showed at the very beginning. 
and this kind of like circle um, is showing this whole idea of yeah what is growth actually meaning in our industry like the the very factor everything is based on so i'll just quickly jump okay i'm talking for quite some time already um now i'll jump into context tour a bit so i started this thread in 2017 with katarina when we started dming on instagram in 2018 we katarina texted i'm in berlin do you want to have a coffee instagram friendships this is how everything started so we decided to meet for a coffee um i was too late it was horrible she, she had her, her son with her that was sick so it was a very uh, suboptimal meeting um, but we kind of like had a really good vibe and uh, yeah kind of like started to talk even more after the meeting and then I always wanted to apply at Future Architecture the platform that I introduced before as well so I thought maybe I can do this with Katarina because she is cool and I really want to work with her so I said maybe we should apply there together and then we applied there together and we didn't um, get into the final selection, but we were, when you apply, you're in a pool and the institutions that were participating in the, in the process picked us, um, like the Fondation Mies van der Rohe picked us for coming to Barcelona to do interviews. So this was when I was still working at Arc Plus. So we went there together, the two of us, uh, to Barcelona, to the prize uh, ceremony. It was so weird because you as a young, uh, like I and Katarina, we were like with our cameras going there, being excited. Uh, there was Jan de Wilde, Arno was there, then Anne Lacaton was there. So you had all this kind of like world stars of architecture and we were there and trying to interview people. So if you know the context to an Instagram page, you might have seen um, this short video of Arno. Uh, I knew Arno from Arc Plus because we, I met him for uh, one of the Heft uh, Besprechungen, Redaktionssitzungen. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna ask Arno because if I ask the first person, he kind of like might still remember my face, so he might say yes. So I dragged him there for the interview and he did a really nice interview. That was a bomb end. He was very helpful because he said, okay, I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna get you Jan de Wilde. So he got us the next person. So this helped us a lot to um, do the videos. And he remembered my face. So he, when, I, when Olaf said, Angelica is an option for the office, he already knew who I am. So this is a very funny side story as well, how things are connected. So context to now is an Instagram page and the website you already saw. Um, Katarina and I and Patrick, who is doing the graphic design, so it's basically the three of us working on the project, uh, are dealing with two accounts as well with this job account and the website. So we're doing interviews uh, to kind of like give an impression of where the industry is at. Uh, we have a set of questions that is pretty similar every time. It's like eight to 12 questions. And the people are free to answer as extensively as they want, uh, the way they want, and what, with whatever topics they are, they are dealing with. It's not so much about picking the office with a big name, but rather finding young offices or giving offices a, a voice that are not heard or don't have the chance to be represented in like the architecture media. Um, and the platform itself is yeah pretty wide, let's say, um, on the most intensive exchanges happening in the stories. And there is one of the yeah, the most pressing questions that comes up again and again and again is pay uh, in architecture, intern salaries. So as you might remember from what I said before, money was always a point for myself as well. So it's like scratching my own itch in a way um, through this like very long time of searching for ways to finance myself. Um, this topic yeah, was and is uh, somehow something I'm very yeah, not concerned with, of course. 
but um, yeah, and it's kind of like part of, of the work I'm doing now as well. And um, the exchange that happens there is actually at the moment interesting, interestingly transforming into several other side threads. Like there's a Dank Lloyd Ride with the memes format on Instagram. They just published a longer text on eFlux. Then there is um, another German in initiative, let's say another Instagram account. Then there are several more international accounts. So at the moment there is quite some things moving, uh, at least in, in, let's say my age generation, like people that are on the edge of maybe founding themselves. And I think this is a very interesting point because exactly these people will be the decision-making generation very soon. And they are kind of like aware how it is not to earn a lot, but they are not yet aware how hard it might be to pay good. So it's like a very interesting situation. Um, so this is Context Tour Map that is a teaser of something we're working on at the moment with Context Tour. So we try to uh, put this topic of um, offices and pay in kind of like a format. It's not ready yet, but it might be launched next year, soon, hopefully. Um, and I switch back to my own account. So that's like the things that happened very recently. Um, it's not only about pay for us as architects, but as well more overarching, like who is building architecture? What are they owning? Um, what is the overall system behind? And then this is even more recent. Uh, we did, or like together with Brand Louvre Plus and Charlotte Malta Bart, um, we launched an initiative, or like let's say a more um, a panel round that was called uh, Stop Construction. It was um, a populist claim to put people together to discuss what would happen if we would stop construction overall. What would that mean? Um, connected with resource extraction, extraction of work. What does that mean for new offices? So um, in the framework of this idea or populist claim, we discussed a set of pressing questions. And yeah, that's the most recent nine images on my Instagram. Um, you can see the, the conquest that's a slide about the work at the ETH we're doing now. And yeah, so that's kind of like my, you can see as well the transformation from only having architecture or images. Now my work as well on Instagram or like the reflection I'm doing on Instagram moved more into the, let's say, I don't actually like to call it theoretic, but more content-based reflective work. And overall, because we started with the question, am I actually an architect? I would say what I do is more creative direction than architecture, but of course connected with spatial questions. Um, I took this out of a text from Jack Self um, that he did for the CCA. Um, the, the term itself is coming from advertising actually. So the creative director is actually working yeah, in, in advertising or design rather than in architecture. But the, the idea is, or like the, the concept behind is that you're responsible, responsible for, for strategy and yeah, development of a brand's definition and communication. And this is pretty much what I do at Brandel World Plus at least. Um, and as well for, for a context tour. So it's, um, I think, the most fitting understanding. And uh, yeah, the idea of that you have someone, because the, in architecture, it's oftentimes like that you need enough experience to be considered someone that has a say, that someone that is heard needs to be older and experienced. And did, yeah, you need to build something kind of that, that you have a standing in the scene. So I found this idea quite yeah, seductive that you're a young person and that kind of like your vision and idea and the strategic thinking is an impact as well and can be considered, yeah, responsible work or architectural in a way. And from that, 
I will dive in two or three more reflective points um, overall, like on as well how my point of view and my own work evolved, let's say, um, within the last, I think it's not hard to, yeah, no. Okay, I'll just jump on that. Um, in the last year, I focused a lot or like the topic of identity politics and I, how I see myself in the field was very, very present because I'm a woman on one hand, but I'm still white and pretty much privileged uh, on quite some levels. So with speaking more often and being heard on a certain level, the question came up, when do I need to step back? Like, do I need to give someone else the the voice that I might have because there are enough white women already that are speaking let's say so and this is now the connection point as well to the reading that I recommended um, here you can see this intersectionality graphic uh, where you can see um, it's a graphic and a um, yeah, concept let's say about privilege and oppression um, I can only recommend to look at this and yeah, try to find yourself on, on, on this diagram and try to reflect on how you're, how you're dealing with these privileges or like levels of oppression that you are uh, experiencing. So this manifesto for, for the 99%, I find uh, so interesting or worth reading because it tackles more than only um, how do I get to the top as a woman, but rather how do we overall transform the society that there is more options and space and chances for 99% of society and not only the privileged parts. So this kind of like idea of liberal feminism versus feminism that is more inclusive. And then I'm kind of closing. Um, I think for the, for the industry, we are at a very important moment because the climate crisis on one hand and societal questions like housing shortage, um, land price, all these points are super pressing. And at the same time, we as architects are in a situation of pressure. So as Peggy Dima puts it, it's a transitional moment in the profession. When design responsibility and financial safety are shared amongst various players, the constitution of a new model for architectural practice is entirely open. Now is the time to think expansively about what we want this new practice to look like and how its organization might be linked to our larger social, political, and economic formations. I think this is a very important sentence and depending on what point of view you have on architecture, you might absolutely disagree. Um, I think especially in Graz, the, the school is pretty focused on space and form. So this, all this kind of contents that are highly political, very based on economic dynamics, all this kind of stuff only happened to me after my studies basically. And now I kind of like move away even further from architecture, of course. But I think that due to the, the situation, like the, the world situation, let's say, um, we need to shift our how we approach architecture. So this is why I think it's time to, to make this shift as well in architecture. You cannot hide from the world, let's say. I'm closing with Greta. We are the ones making a difference. We, the people in Extinction Rebellion and the children's school strike for, for the climate, we are the ones making a difference. Uh, Greta Thunberg is oftentimes called as populist, as maybe not oftentimes, but there's a paper that uh, says Greta Thunberg and uh, Trump are using the same techniques of populist claims and narration. What I find very interesting and intriguing, like this theory that, that you need this kind of like simplified, very condensed narrations to empower people to envision something that might lead to change. 
and I'm ending with 3.5% because now teaching at the ETH, I experience quite some people that are yeah, desperate, let's say, or yeah, that feel like they are not able to, to add anything to the world. Like we are doing a studio that is dealing with the complexities of food production this term. And I had three or four students. We went to Almeria to the Sea of Plastic, a huge field of greenhouses that are like wrapped with plastic. That's how they grow food there. The working conditions are horrible. The students experienced the situation there, came back, back in Switzerland, very privileged. And they were like, what can we cannot do anything? How should we change the systemic? We cannot do, we cannot do anything. So there was this problem of um, self-efficacy. So they just had the feeling that they could not do anything so they would not do anything at all. What is a real problem? But there is this rule of 3.5%. If you manage to have 3.5% of a society on the street, the pressure, the public pressure is so high that in most cases, change can happen. And I find this very intriguing. And um, yeah, that gives me energy and hope to push uh, for change and transformation. Um, yeah, so I end, I, I end with this positive vision and open the question round. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, yeah, I would love. Uh, so I'm, I'm just, I would, Thank you so much. It is, it, was, it is actually very exciting at the one hand to have such an open. And actually, the, the, the feminist point in your, in your presentation now is this openness, you know, is this total, you know, we could, we could go through your life and actually understand step by step how you build your life as an architect, you know, that, and actually a position that doesn't exist, you know, what you were saying, you didn't have like some kind of a, you know, image that, that or even a, a, a figure, you know, that you can relate to. It is something that you have to establish. It's a no man's land, actually something that the, the, the land that doesn't exist that you have to produce while, you know, uh, going towards the, 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 your profession, you know. So it's really interesting. It, it's in a way how you, you know, go onto your own, own shoulder. I don't know how you say it actually in English. Roseanne, is there an exp expression? And it's very also psychoanalytic, uh, 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 like the approach that you have done now. Yeah, yeah. You actually went deeply into your practice but using, you know, um, and actually, I think it is so useful for, for us, but I think for everybody, for students, to understand actually um, this wide aspect of architecture mm. that is being, ex that, is, that is expanding continuously. So I would just uh, uh, connect to your actually last, you know, something that gives you hope. Mm to hope for what and how do we uh -huh. connect this directly to architecture, you know? And this very also classical notion of... In, in, in change of space, you mean? Exactly. Um, it gives me hope that the next 30 years are not to be dystopic, so that it's not the, um, because when I think of, or like when you hear the, the prognosis about what it means that we have plus three degrees soon, this is so, I don't know, creates anxiety and desperation. And what does that mean? Like, it's just like insecurity and I don't know, it's a lot of pressure, I think, on our generation in a way, mm -hmm. because I'm sure that I'm, I won't live as good as my parents are. And if you want to have children, so you do, we don't know how the work looks like, but I, I still believe that we can make it. 
So it's like, I believe in the, the possibility and the chance for transformation. So it keeps me going. So this is what I, what I believe in. And due to the fact that the building industry is so ingrained in this process of, or like has such an importance on CO2 production and like overall, like how can we house people like the basic needs like where do i live where do i just shelter myself so i see there are a lot of potential like to to turn it into something that can enable people to to live still good in this world mm -hmm. if this is answering your question no no it is because we think, because it is about creating a, a space that enables this this possibility yeah. and as i said you know like this was such a feminist way because it is always you know this question oh this is private you know when we talk now about our careers or our work we divide the private and the, and that what we are doing the professional you know which has to be connected and to some different sphere but actually you know bringing this back bringing your public uh, about, like talk or bring your public thought also together with your private is a very feminist act because there is no division actually be, be between so private also in a sense that you are brave enough to pose questions you know and to see uh, problems you know and to address them directly even we could be you know uh, for many reasons frustrated to do so, especially in this very conservative and traditional architecture field. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have to say that I'm like the, the working environment I created for myself or I'm in at the moment is super progressive. So it's a bubble in itself as well. Um, that helps. So you have people that are kind of like having the same mindset that are not desperate and like have given up any hope already mm -hmm. so it's like it's good to have someone around you that is pushing as well so you don't feel like lost alone but i have like sometimes when i post about the working condition conditions in architecture i have a lot of dms that are full of desperation like i can't do this anymore blah blah blah, blah. so it's like i know it's tough it's like crazy but i think it helps a lot to share the experience mm -hmm. because then others understand that they are not alone yeah to break yeah, this yeah. Uh, consensus of yeah. silence you know yeah which is and also true. like shame that is associated with feelings of failure or yeah. feelings of or, or even just like seeing that you don't have a role model yeah no and it shows as well like yeah. diving into this very private like how did i finance this mm -hmm. um I mean, on one hand, it maybe gives another person an idea how to do it. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, it, it kind of like makes clear how different the, the starting points are because some people can't just afford it. They don't need to think about it. They have parents that pay it. And it's nothing, I don't want to shame these people. It's great that they that are able to do it. But if you, it, it's, an, it's just such a big difference if, your parents are not able to financially help you with that. As well, when it comes to starting your own practice, I could never start my own practice in the sense of just, I don't know, start with what money? Yeah. No, that's just not an option. And I think it's like super, because I don't know, it's like, that's something that needs to be discussed. Yeah. I would like to, thank you. I would like to really like invite you to also post questions or or just kind of share your thoughts with us and also to everyone um on to all the students who are joining us online like we would really love to hear from you as well because in a sense this is really for you <laughs> there's a question amazing so you were saying that um you've had experiences where you've gone into firms where you've realized sort of in the first, within the first half a year that this is not a place for you. How would you sort of give, or what advice would you give to our generation, people who are just starting off in that branch, that when we go in, when we dive into such like a, the pool of a career, what advice would you give as sort of like red flags to watch out for, 
for being sort of mistreated in, um, in a first career um, circumstance or situation where we can really think about like our own general well-being as well as sure wanting to be able to make um, something out of ourselves quickly. Mm, I think it's super individual. Like red flags depends very much on your own perception of how far you can go. But I think as soon as you feel like you need to do something that is going across your border or like your own idea of what is too much, like if you're forced to work over hours, if I mean, it's like the worst case situation sometimes, or like the problem is often that there is a, um, a culture created that is not saying you need to stay until 10, but if everyone stays until 10, you're somehow forced. So you cannot really say anything. So what I can only recommend is be, but it's, that's nothing that you, I think it's really hard to learn, let's say, really reflect on how you feel in the situation. Because when I was at MBRDV and working so much, it, it felt okay. It's only now that I can say this was crazy too much. That was not okay in no, no moment, and not no moment, but like 90% of, of the time it was beyond my, my personal borders. So I had a, yeah, it's really hard to say what the red flag is. It's more about being aware what you want and what what you can uh, give maybe but in general i mean talk to people that work there already like keep your ears open i mean sometimes there is this chit chat that maybe it's yeah not always true but in general especially when you aim for bigger names you can find out how it is to work there mm -hmm. and then it's pretty much about yeah um, smartly picking as well where you want to go and maybe it's not the the office with a big name but rather an office that has a set of values that you like so it's as well about how you look at the industry but it's hard to to change this or like to make it your task to change this i would rather say this is a, a task as well for the teaching staff at universities to point this out because how would you know? It's like, it's a lot about as well, the cultures in the studios. If you're in Graz, I think it's pretty relaxed, but at the ETH in Zurich, there are certain studios as well, where it is very common to work a lot. So it's like, people expect you to be there. Like in, in Hong Kong, when I was, I worked on a Saturday on a private project and our head of the studio came in to check in if people were working on a Saturday. So I was working on my private project and was like, why aren't you working on the studio? So if these situations are created, that's not the, I mean, I was aware that this was not okay because of like how I was taught in Europe. So like when you grow up or you learn in this kind of environments, it's, yeah, it's not your fault how you look at things. So it needs as well a change in, in the teaching, I would say, in certain schools. Yeah. Are there any other questions here? Um, yeah. <laughs> you, I, I remember the interview you gave, Fran uh, Luber gave, and there was something about like, you have, to, it's on you to change the system and the payment and so on. And uh, maybe it's a stupid question, but how do you see your working conditions now in the office? Because you have this background or you have this uh, like idea of what it should be and how do you see your work now at this office? It's, I don't know. Do you mean payment-wise, how we pay no, in the office? In general, there's working conditions. Are you okay with them or because you have this strong opinion? Yeah. Mm, the office, I think the working conditions in the office are really healthy um, in terms of working hours, because that's like when we onboard people, when I onboard people, I say that they're not allowed to stay longer than at six. 
so they need to finish any, everything before six, at least the interns. Uh, of course, when you do a competition or if there is something that is like needs to be done, sometimes you stay a bit longer, just like in every normal office, but it's not like everyone would stay there until 10. This is just a no-go. Um, and this is, I think, very much about as well the organizational structure. So it's a lot about management and how the core team works themselves. So I work too much. At, as well now in the setup I work because I have like at least four to five projects running at the same time always because it's context tour brand with my own stuff and universe uh, Zurich so it's like a lot of things but I try to for example I don't send emails on Sunday I schedule my emails so they are sent out on Monday in the morning and not Sunday evening this is things that the core team can implement and do so I don't expect anyone to answer on the weekend i don't send any emails on the weekend i don't put pressure on people so it's like it's very much how you as a core team or like the management of an office is working and what they are expecting so it's as well again about culture how you deal with it and of course it's not always perfect i don't want to in no sense are we perfect at brandenburg plus and it's often a fight about ex exactly these topics um, but if there are people that are aware of the topics, it's uh, at least someone fighting for the topics. And that's already a, a um, yeah, step in the right direction, I would say. But um, can you, uh, sorry, so no, no, no. no, this was like, I just want to, I will ask later. <laughs> um, I just want to ask, like, you said before you had this job in Graz while studying in Hong Kong to afford it. Um, I just want to also with this uh, making a change and, and stuff, it's like um, that I always feel like there is no time actually because time is uh, running so fast for like we have to change. Or even the the um, like office conditions, all this stuff has to change to um, like to have a better future. But in set in the same or meanwhile, um, everyone is busy having their life, mm -hmm. like affording it, like um, doing projects to get paid. Um, like it's just this. 24 hours or 12 hours or 18 hours, mm -hmm. somebody could work if they like um, architecture field. Um, but then you're at this point, okay, I should have this, even in, I, I imagine even as a boss, or, um, I should have this healthier conditions, but I'm running out of people, of time, of also money yeah. to make the change. So like what's what's the <laughs> you're asking me for a solution. The, the... No. I wanna add, can I add to this? Yeah. Which is just like because your whole presentation kind of as Melissa pointed to is pointing to it's like you didn't have a role model but you're chasing constantly chasing new opportunities that you're attracted to, which we all have to do this is a condition where we, which we, in which we find ourselves and then you also posted this loving your job is a capitalist trap slide <laughs> and i just wondered because <laughs> this is in a sense like the contradiction that we all face like i guess in art or architecture or anywhere where there's like uh, an aspect of um not devotion but some some you know there's a kind of yeah there's this amazing word in german ambiguitet tolerance <laughs> yeah like, so, you, you kind of like need to manage to have this extremes in your or like that's yeah i think i have a very high tolerance for ambiguity in my life okay so it's like this crazy pulse and it's like you know oftentimes it's too much i'm working too much yeah it's yeah and oftentimes it's like i have a moment where i'm like oh my God, and then I I try to focus and think what my priorities are, 
And if I'm still on the right path, this is how I deal with it. But it's super personal. I, I think I, there will be a moment when I drop out for a while and just don't do this extreme work anymore. But for now, it's the right way for me to deal with all. I, I love the speed and the dynam dynamics of the many projects, but I, I can feel it already that there will be a limit and then I need to drop out and then I need to reconfigure how I deal with things. You hope so. <laughs> That's another question. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know if it's a question, it's more like maybe a reflection. It's kind of in line with what Lena said. Um, because you know, now you, you are in this kind of condition where you have a lot of control, kind of. I mean, in comparison to like an intern who's paid like, like paid nothing, yeah. almost nothing. And then I just always like, um, so also thinking about it in the sense of like feminism for the 99 percent, and then like how you actually have to chase, like how you actually have to be in the system. So you have to get these internships and find ways in which you are like to, to support yourself and afford it and to, you know, do this and this and this in order to like have these connections in order to have this like opportunity to do the work which kind of qualifies you to be where you want to be yeah and then i'm just like also um i remembered something from the bank drive when there was also an internship posted uh, from oma so mm -hmm. they posted an internship and they wrote like no nine to five mentality and then like everybody was like making memes about it and then they took it off but of course that doesn't like change i i'm sure it would not change the conditions in the internship itself but like i just remembered how it is um and also i think like this overwork culture uh it is in no way healthy but also it's like so much worse when you're just actually working in an architecture office as an intern, as like a starting junior architect, just because you also have like so little control. Mm -hmm. And when you are actually 12 hours in the office, you're just like that because you didn't do it for you. You're just like, you're having kind of almost a no satisfaction in it. And then like when you are in this position doing five projects, I think it's just like you are overworking, but it's just so different. Mm -hmm. You know? yeah, yeah. So I just also think there is no like agency. Uh, there is very little agency when you're just in like this office yeah. doing like this drawing architecture yeah, yeah. that you didn't have any like decision making. <laughs> you know, role. This is a super important add-on. Okay. No, people don't hear what you say, right? I think they do. Yeah, they do. Okay, yeah. good. I hope that everyone did. because otherwise I would have repeated. She just maybe repeat yeah, it. Please. You pointed out that agency is a very important aspect. So if you're drawing monkey in an office and you're like 12 hours, it's different than if you work on your own projects. And this is of course very like definitely um, um, a super important point. And then the I would like to add something to what you said before, like this Dan Lloyd Wright dynamics with memes, nine to five, blah, 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 that this is not changing anything in the office or like, I agree, this won't change anything at OMA because they're a machine and people still want to go there because of the name. Uh, and we have, or I have a fight with Olaf on this on a very regular basis because I say it's important to talk about things and to make people aware because this is already inducing or like helping people to find their voice on the topic. So you can only be aware if you know that the problem exists. Olaf says, it's not enough to talk about things. We need to present a different model. If we don't have a legit model, how to do it differently, there is no change at all. So it's like, I think this is our two important aspects that need to be somehow balanced. Um, because both are true in a way, um, but I cannot develop the model or the solution. This is, I mean, I can find a way for myself and I mean, in the best case, I can create working spaces for others too that might work and that are not as 
horrible like or destroying people as we see now um but still i won't be the person that is changing the world alone let's say maybe it's interesting but it's the thing between because if a lot of people know about something there are a lot of minds like circling around it and maybe the then there's a lot more chance to even have a good idea yeah. to have a model or something yeah you know it is interesting actually and this is very much about architecture then you said either you are working on a project or it is your own project so what is lacking is actually not it's a collaboration in architecture. I mean, this is something that offices are always, you know, under certain name, and then you work for somebody, you know, you can have a better position there, that you bring more decisions, or you're leading the project, or the different options, as I, as I understand. But actually, and there is always a team that works, which is then competitive because, of course, architecture is. But I don't know, like, this change of culture, you know, and the way you presented your work and your life, you know, this form that you presented, that it's more collective, all your conversations, all your... So, you know, how, how much can can this be, you know, implemented in the, in the offices, you know, more collaborative aspect of, of work, you know, that people are not, of course, like in capitalism, there is this idea that competition will take the best. Of, but I think I believe like differently. I believe that identification with the, with a certain topic, with a certain idea where you can see yourself, you know, but not to be exploited from like more hierarchy, but to find your place there is something, you know, that, that actually, and I don't know if this is at all possible, you know, in the field of architecture, because then you, you know how much the, the people who are running offices, what pressures they are. Uh, they 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 live. Yeah, yeah. Because the, most of the time they're in the courts, they're in the you know, yeah, yeah. having been sued, etc. In order to get anything of that work that they have done, so it's that's the same kind of like level of complexity we are actually seeing with the studio as well in Almeria. I mean, maybe this um, what I'm doing now it's not really working out, but to explain it, what I want to say. So you have the workers there that are suffering under the conditions of the work and you think when you go there oh my god i need to do something for the workers so you talk to the workers organization and say they say the farmers na 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 the farmers are the bad guys and then you go to the farmers and they are talking to you and the farmers say we just there's so much pressure on us the pricing system these and that blah 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 blah, blah. we cannot pay more because we don't earn anything from it anymore so you kind of like step up to the next level. So it's like the the overall like food chain that is kind of like connected with, yeah. And so it's like, it's and that's, it's the same like in architecture, the architects are the farmers in a way. So there is a level above real estate industry. I mean, you can look into the Excel sheet, who is earning the money, the people that are investing into the building. So it's really about, yeah, okay, now I'm talking about systemic change again. But it's, yeah, that's, that's like, we need to kind of like look beyond these two levels to understand the core problem. It's really about asking where does the problem come from and then trying to solve the core or the root problem. But this is like, you cannot do this alone. It's like just too difficult that you can start tackling it. I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, just do you think that this collaboration that you already have with the people who are into this is this, you know, it's also a generational thing because more information is circulating because of you know different media that is here. Yeah. So and I don't know if if there, yeah, if Good. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to understand yeah. if if you have 
you know, because you have this optimism, but is there also like a generational impact of a whole generation that is in a problem and that sees that has to collaborate actually in yeah. order to survive? Yeah. Is this something that also has like you slowly can you imagine or do you see this somehow that it already changes the practice? Can I also add to that? Yeah. <laughs> Because, sorry, just to kind of bring this back, or and then I'll moderate again. <laughs> just to bring this back to the political aspect of your presentation, and also the kind of contradictions that you present. Mm -hmm. So um, you're also living in in many kind of you're living contradictions. We all are. Yeah. So um, in a sense, like I'm just trying to synthesize a bit because you're saying can collaboration actually like help us solve the problem, which is we see like a systemic. No, I did not see not, like, not solve. solve the problem. Sorry. Like, no, okay. okay. Just, sorry, I don't want to put words no, in your mouth, no, no, but like contribute to no, no, a new, no, so not no. solve, but maybe alleviate the pressure or, no. or kind of, no? Change. Or cha okay, change, <laughs> yeah. like transform yeah. a situation. Whereas in the feminism for the 99%, the model that is offered is like a feminist strike. And this isn't collaboration. It's actually like withdrawal yeah. or refusal. Yeah. And um, so I'm just kind of just to kind of put these questions on in on the table. We don't have but, but um, it's different collaboration. This is a co collaboration in the way how you do architecture, you know, and it's collaborative, like collaborative learning, etc. But what you're mentioning now to a feminist track, this is about collaboration with the enemy, let's say, you know, and that is broken and actually starts with the strike. So these are two different aspects of collaboration, I wanted to say, like collective work versus collaboration, let's say. Yeah. I will, didn't mention collaboration, but collective yeah. work more before. Yeah, like a more, like a more, okay, there's a, the model, which is like a more collective form of work where you could find yourself like, having something at stake in the project mm -hmm. and you can see yourself being represented like in a cooperative where everyone would potentially like um gain in, this, in a similar way yeah like there would be a redistribution we you know in the history of the 20th century we've seen certain models we, they don't exist anymore so much but um but but as lena is kind of saying like we cut like there's time is running out and you also said like okay you have some hope but there's um this kind of impending collapse of everything we've also <laughs> like living we're kind of seeing it like increasingly intensified in intensified forms so i'm just i'm just i'm just kind of curious about yeah how or maybe my my question is just about the contradictions between like wanting to find forms of collective work where you can do your your projects and your work and then like really actually probably the only way to solve solve the problem of climate catastrophe is that everyone stops working or in the model you, you presented what happens if we think about stop and construction or and then there's also like the model that you presented with the interviews which is like already like a kind of mediating yeah. form, like making an inquiry into the conditions of yeah. work that can raise the consciousness but a lot, a lot of thoughts um <laughs> I think translating your the two aspects of collaboration and like I would say this kind of like different ideas of working together and striking for change, let's say, let's call it like that, is already in a way existing. You have on one hand the Peggy Dima lobbying work where they kind of like try to form like lobbies against the situation and then you have rather the other like model for offices that are um collaboration based like assemble like something like that but bigger networks coming together and somehow this fight or like these two poles are existing in architecture for quite a while there is uh, an art plus issue one of the very early ones where this topic was already discussed how to deal with that in architecture because this topic is not new it's not like we are the first ones to discuss this so 
I guess there is not the right model. I think it needs all of this kind of new models. How I understand my work or like how I'm how would how I would put myself into the system is, or like I would say I'm somehow trying to build up counter networks that are yeah networks I know with or like people that I know that have a certain mindset or are kind of like willing to do things differently so you just uh, I mean you build up networks that help to push an agency that you would like to go for but still as soon as the pressure of the system is too high like as soon as you need to earn money due to reasons some people drop they need to drop out because there is no other option so it's like for me it's more giving possibilities or like sharing possibilities opening up chances to to make it make things differently as soon as i can but sometimes i can't so it's like it's a very hard trial of balancing things out in the dynamics we're in and i yeah there is no way to solve it but you can just try to make it a bit better <laughs> Yeah, it's frustrating, but yeah, but cool at the same time. Yeah, and this is the, yeah. Oh my God, this cannot be the closing word. <laughs> 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 like we should close in like 10 minutes or so. Okay, yeah. There are yeah, two questions. <laughs> are you sometimes missing out the traditional way of designing architecture and concentrating on the space and material? And Sometimes you miss on is there a way that you can combine it? Yeah, there would be a way if I wanted to. Um, but I very specifically said I don't want to draw anything. So I participate in the parts of yeah, no, really, literally. It's like I can do a diagram. <laughs> I don't want to see a cut program. Um no, but I'm more, I think my, the, the scale of work I'm interested in most is a very big scale. So I like to join in for strategic meetings at the very beginning. Um, this is very specific for Brandlube Plus because most of the ideas are based on an argument or a content idea. So like, I don't know, uh, no good example. Um, for example, the Terrassenhaus, the idea was to recreate the space taken away from the land for the public. So the terraces during the day are supposed to be open so that everyone can walk up. So I'm very much interested in this content-based development or strategy-based development of an idea. But as soon as it's about, is it gray or red, I'm out of the game. It's just like, I'm too pragmatic and too... That's nothing I like to do because it's a lot about taste and you can fight about taste forever and I don't want to fight forever. So it's like, I, I rather say, you fight and I go do something else. So I don't really miss this process of like detailing and, and drawing. Um, maybe this will change though. I think I'm very, uh, my, I'm very flexible in the sense of um, shifting interests and then I just go for it. Um, but yeah, so I can tell. Maybe one day I think I need to draw again, but for the moment I don't. Yeah, no, I just want to flex in that for a second, like <laughs> to imagine if we, like, uh, since like, talking about this going through the system to actually have the chance to make some change. If we would, if we should not actually instead as the 99%, like, and I think that's what Dan Floyd Wright like kind of tries to do with this means to actually like boycott these, um, this 1% that actually contributes to the making of this horrifying like condition, you know? Um, I don't know, like, what might bring that to happen, but it's just like, I just, um, I think it's, it's like one way to actually do it is to just like leave out this like 1% that is like 
now the present, you know, the present controlling of also like what we see, how we perceive architecture, what we think is the role model or the place to be, yeah, yeah. and like to actually form. And I think that would be the like collective ways of working, like to operate like on smaller scales, but to actually, yeah, it's this like change from the love of or something. But I just don't know like what would bring that, you know, like how. How would that happen? Yeah, because I think all these discourses yeah. that are built out of this other kind of communicating, trying to work differently, actually they are parasiting on this strong system, you know. And as soon as you have a possibility to get into an office to have a better position, you will take all that what you have, but you will take also this kind of power position, you know? So, so I think this is the, 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 this system still parasites, you know? So this was always my question, you know, how is it then, uh, if it's generational thing and actually connected to all these changes that are so strong, you know, that, that are pr producing a quantity Mm. that can change, you know, instead of cutting all, as you said, boycott, you know, cutting all, uh, let's say, connections with this, but then you cannot survive at all. Yeah, exactly. How would you survive? Because it parasites on these small, let's say, um, unused channels still, yeah. or, or you have to discover new challenges of surviving, of surviving in order to be within this. But actually, you know, the system is automatically appropriating these channels and using actually again for this strong competitive yeah. under pressure, uh, you know, production and world. There are several problems with this kind of like parasite um, idea. The thing is, or like you can see this as well in at the ETH, the people or like the master degree students at the very end are doing because our studio uh, studio is pretty conceptual, let's say. So we're working a lot with narration and argumentation. But everyone in the master's program in the last two or three semester, they are trying to do architectural projects so they have a portfolio they can use to apply with, of course, because they need a job in Switzerland to pay their very expensive friends. Um, the people that very specifically decide not to go this way are the people that are then maybe calling in in our office and say, guys, you told us that this model we are, are, we are taught at school doesn't work anymore. We want to do it differently. Can you give us a job? And then we need to say, no, we can't because there, currently there is no work in the office. So you could say I'm a role model maybe for being the parasite, even if I would not agree, but I'm not a regular part of the industry, let's say. And even I had to kind of like find a different way to set myself up to sustain a living. And if you don't have the ability to kind of like think in terms of how do I build myself a business model to pay my rent, that is something that is not taught in architecture school, you're kind of lost because how do you, no one gives you the knowledge how to do it. Maybe you're smart. Maybe you have someone in your family that is a, a business person that gives you like, it's very simple thing, things often like how to get a good tax advisor, how to have legal support. That is something I did not have. That is something I really had to build up and it was a, in the S it was really this is kind of like resources you don't have when you don't grow up in a business context. So it's like, it's really, yeah, I think this is uh, in a way, sometimes it's over romanticized this idea of making things different because it's hard to make things different because you kind of like really need to build yourself a system and it's not, that's not easy. So it's, I totally agree that we need to do it. But if we tell students to do it differently, and this is the discussion again, do we point out or do we give models? It's it's a very it's not so easy to solve problem. Um, so if you have the abilities or you, if you can get the abilities, that's as well a reason why I decided to do this other master's degree. 
that focuses more on business. So I would have this knowledge in a way. Um, yeah, so I, oh, well, still no solution, but like. <laughs> Is yeah, there is a question in the chat, um, which maybe goes in this direction somehow, but, but also maybe more simple. Um, thank you so much. It was very interesting. I'm an Erasmus student from Brazil, and when I compare my home university with TU, I can realize that they are very similar in some aspects, like this logic, form, and space. So could you recommend for us some more innovative or oh. out-of-the-system <laughs> university? <laughs> uh, maybe the impossible question. Um, uh, the recommendation would rather be look out for offices or like professors that are doing things differently. And if you'd ask me, sometimes even go to do other studies or like if you can, because you actually can do this here at Theo Graz as well, you can join other classes at the KF or like other universities. Sometimes it helps to just get out of the bubble and talk with other people. Um, yeah. But the whole problem, I think, sometimes here is that everybody's so busy. Everybody's so busy, like getting, getting. I think, like Milica said, it, is it a, is it a generational um, thing? I think maybe yes, because the if people in the office or people offices change, there is they they got through all this stuff to have a to have an office and then they can change something. But if if people at university do that, even say no, we don't want to do it like that. Um, it's there are more people as um, even yeah then there's one office everyone wants to be there because they make a different um or they make it different but even even uh students at the ETH are facing like do do their um i don't know building projects to even sustain but if there's this question of should we do it like that i think there is only individual answers to this because you need to decide yourself what you can do and what you can't and I think it's totally digit when you say it's too much to not do it. Mm. As, as, as simple and as dis difficult as that. Um, yeah, it's like your own borders and limits and you really need to find out mm -hmm. if where, where this border and where this limit is. Yeah. Just, no, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say that maybe also Answer this question, we should look at the 3.5% rule that you presented. And like, maybe not everybody can do it, but it's 3.5% of like, because Rosanne also had a history of strike like also in the university. So as students, like only maybe a small percentage would decide that they actually would rather not, you know, go through three studios of design that they don't want. And maybe like, even it's like very tough, but maybe this 3.5% can actually. Also not in the street, but in other ways. Yeah. Collective power is really strong as well, like. Yeah, there's a question. <clears throat> yeah, maybe not a question, but kind of a revision of what you said. I think it's a lot about also being pragmatic. And um, like you said, the way, um, the way you got to these things is through scholarships and through stuff, which is actually out of an idea. And it's also a lot about sharing these opportunities because there are opportunities. Mm. And, um, when you know what to look for, you, you can go there and you can do some things. And I think that's also one big part of collaboration and um, sharing, sharing knowledge. To go where. And that's very pragmatic because it's nothing you have to invent, it's something mm. there. You just have um, maybe also the network besides you that um, kind of. Says, yeah, you can do it, but shouldn't you get this? Yes. Why should yeah. someone else get it at the same chance? Ask for information as well. Like, that, this is a very good tip for students. Like, very recently, or not very recently, but um, I am on a regular basis, I'm asked how to apply at Arc Plus. So I kind of like, yeah, if you want to know something, ask people that already did this or work there or 
whatever. In most cases, or like I, I try to always be helpful because I know how hard it is to get in. So I always try to, I don't know, recommend or like at, at least reflect on, on questions um, that I get. Um, but it's, it's so easy to write an email or to DM someone, like especially in, in our times. So just, just do it. Yeah, and you can break the cycle of privilege because knowledge is privilege. And if you come from an academic background, you have the cultural knowledge, and people often don't know about these organizations, and you can talk about it. And that's already a big step on giving other people a chance yeah. to know about these internships. Or even if I don't want to take an internship with my friends or my parents, I can give it to friends, or I can talk about it. I think that's a big part of it, and that doesn't take a lot of energy. That's nice closing words. <laughs> okay, we should do this here. This is, should we end there with this idea of it's knowledge nice, sharing? Nice yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Angelica. Thanks everyone for <laughs> listening to me for such a long time. And thanks everyone who joined us via Zoom.